Thanks, David and crew. Well, that was our message in that song. <laughs> Amen. Are we done? There we go. Thanks, you guys. Um, what, a, what an awesome message of God's love there for us. Yeah, my name is Will Orschel, one of the pastors here. And today's our first Sunday of the month. So we have an opportunity to celebrate that love of God in communion. And, uh, but before we, we do that, I want to talk about some good works that were part of that. Go ahead and bring me up those slides there. Guys, sometimes we come into communion and we do it the first of the month and we just sort of gets to be a little bit of a routine thing that we're doing. And so uh, I just want us to stop a little bit before we do that and just reflect on what, what communion is all about is a, and how, how did that relationship between us and God get restored and what, what good works have to do as a part of that too. Yeah, so... Let me pray for us here before we get started. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace to us. God, I know everybody's had a lot of things going on this week. Some, some things to rejoice about. Some things are just hard. I know some folks are just tired. I saw a lot of folks yawning this morning on the way in. Um, but you know all of the things that have happened to us. And I just pray, God, uh, your spirit would work through your word this morning and, and help us just be in awe of you and your love, Father. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go on that next slide. I just want to start off with uh, Ephesians 2. We're going to kind of center in on this uh, set of verses here. Let me just read this for us. It says, once you were dead. Did you guys know that? Who's the you? It's everybody in this room. It says, once you were dead. Wow. Okay. Is that like part of your life history thing? You meet somebody and say, oh, my name is Will. I used to be dead. No, just start to... <laughs> wow, okay. Well, that's true. Let's, let's talk about why you were dead here. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Is that something else you start off when you tell somebody, hey, my name's Will. I was dead and I was a jerk, right? Is that like the opening line that you get going on? Well, we don't usually start that way because we don't like to talk about ourselves. We don't even like to think about ourselves that way. But God says that's who we all were. So don't argue with me. Argue with him. That's, that's his observation of us, right? He says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the who? The devil. Yeah. And a lot of times we like to think, so, well, you know, God's here and Satan's over here and I'm just sort of in the middle. And God says, no, when you were dead, you actually we're with him, okay? Hi, my name's Will, used to be dead, did a lot of terrible things, and I was a Satanist. No, that's, that's not normally the way the phrase starts off, because we don't think about ourselves that way. But God says, you know, there's only two kingdoms, there's God's people and those that are not part of God, and if you're not part of God, you actually belong to Satan. Oh, not another way we like to think about ourselves. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Well, who were those? Those who were dead, right? That were apart from God. Those are the ones who refused to obey. And how many of us refused to obey God? All of us. All of us. That was all of us here. Your pastors included. Sorry you affirmed us. We're if you'd known that, maybe you wouldn't have voted for us last time, right? But that's all of us. Listen to what else he has. He says, he says, all of us used to live that way. But you didn't know about that, about Greg. Or Rana. Or Van. Or Matt. Matt's looking at me, that's why I called his name out. Or Daywin, right? All of us, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature... And by our very nature, that's like what is in our heart. Even the things we hide from everybody else, right? God gets to see it. That's who we were. By our very nature, we were subject to God's what? Anger, right? Some of your translations will say wrath, right? Just like everybody else. All right, should we close? Does that sound a good place to stop? We'll go home now. Aren't you feeling better? No, <laughs> Pat says, no, I'm not feeling better. Yeah, well, now, we don't like to think about it that way because we look at other people and we say, well, I'm, I ain't as bad as them, right? We all, we all got somebody we're looking at kind of shaking our head 
about how they behave, right? Come on, kids. It's your brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's your parents. Parents, sometimes it's your kids, right? Grandparents, we never shake our heads over grandkids. That doesn't happen. That's right. Because they're perfect, right? You don't have to worry about that. No, they're not. I shake my heads over my grandkids a lot too. Well, let me help you with just a little bit of insight in terms of what those things are that you were doing or maybe are still doing as well that set you so far away from God. Let's give us the next slide. So we have these things called the what? Ten Commandments. That's right. They're up in the... Uh, you can go to the courthouse here in town. We actually have them in two little slabs of concrete there. You can read them up there for right now. Isn't that funny? That's because people forgot that they got put there in the 50s. If they knew that they were there, they'd take them out. But they're still there. But God says these, these commandments are written in our hearts. Okay? Yeah. So, how many, hey, how many are here that are uh, high school or younger? Raise your hands. No, nope. Don, put your hands down. Come on, kids, raise your hands. There you go. Oh, what? This is a good one up here. Number one, two, three, four. It says, honor your father and mother. You know what that means? You listen to them and without shaking your head and saying, well, you may be telling me that in my heart. I ain't going to go do it, right? Or maybe you tell them that out loud too. You could do that as well, right? But guess what? All of us have done what? We have dishonored our parents, Right? Even Don and Pat, as old as they are, they hit, right, Don? Fair? <laughs> it's so long ago. That's right. Well, yeah, from, the, from some of our oldest folks, Galen here, to our youngest, we've all dishonored our parents, right? It says, don't steal. Ever taken something that wasn't yours? Yeah. I did that when I was 10 years old. Used to go to a five and dime store. I lived on a farm. We didn't have much stuff, and we got to go to the, the five and dime store every two weeks, right? And they had, man, they had these little, little plastic toy ships, and they were a quarter piece. And I found out my grandma had a drawer in her bedroom, and guess what was in that drawer? Quarters. <laughs> quarter piece, quarters. Seemed pretty obvious to me, right? So the next time we went, man, I had a whole handful of quarters, and guess what I got? I got all these toy ships, and so, you know, I'm out there, you know, got a big bulk tank, because we live on a farm, that's where the cows drink, but it's a big tank, and I got all my little ships, and my grand grandpa comes, I says, how'd you get those? And I says, grandpa, there's just some things you just don't need to know, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and uh, after grandma got the yardstick and used it, not to measure things, but to help warm my rear end. I didn't get to keep the ships either, but I did, because why? Because I stole, right? Yeah, didn't do that, right. Ooh, don't murder. How many of you guys have murdered anybody? Nobody's raising your hands, because <laughs> it's on videotape. <laughs> all right, I want everybody to raise your hands, because you're all murderers. Did you know that? You said, well, I'm not a murderer. You know what Jesus said? He says, you've heard it said you shall not kill. But he says, if you've been angry unjustly with your brother in your heart, it's the same as murder. Casey, you don't like that one, huh? No. So we're all guilty. Remember, we're all guilty of all these things. We broke them all. You may say, don't commit adultery. Well, some, some of you may say, well, I, I'm not old enough to commit adultery, or maybe I've been married to the same person. I haven't done that. Guess what Jesus also said? He, says, he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. He says, but if you've thought it, it's the same as doing it, right? Wow. Yeah. So that's why we're all guilty before God. Let's keep going. And if that was the end of it, there wouldn't be much to celebrate in communion, right? But thank, thank God that is not the end of the story. So let's keep reading here in Romans. When we were utterly helpless, when, who was utterly helpless? Us, all of us, utterly helpless. I was utterly helpless. Greg was utterly helpless. Everybody in this room was utterly helpless. Galen sitting in the back, been with us for decades. An aeon, utterly helpless. Bill, Christ came at just the right time. (laughs) 
but for God, right? But for God, Christ came at just the right time. And he died for who? For the utterly helpless. For everybody in this room. Because we couldn't do anything. Because we were utterly helpless, right? Now he says, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. There are people dying all over the world today for other people, for causes, right, that they believe in. So they're, they're saying, I'm willing to put my life on the line because this is a cause that's greater than me. But God, he says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still, what, in open rebellion against him, right? No, nobody's out there dying for somebody that hates them in the world today. That's not happening. We were all haters of God. And while we were still haters of God, walking, running as far away from him as, as fast as we could, God says, I'm choosing to let my son come and die on a cross. That's why we have that cross up here to remind us of that, right? And take the punishment that should have been ours. He took that on himself so that why? Why? God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight, well, the since we made, made right was because God says, when you accept that gift, you're made. He says, I don't see you as in being an open rebellion to me, as being lost without hope. He says, what? I see you as being made right. This thing that was ugly and deformed and hopeless has been made right and is now beautiful and is whole. By the, not because we've done good, beautiful, wholesome things. He says, made right in God's sight by what? By the blood of Christ. He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That's what God says. Is, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. Not because of the good things we've done, but because of the good things that God did for us. And it cost him the most precious thing he had. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were in a relationship for all of eternity. In a love we can just barely start getting a glimpse of understanding. And the Son said, I will take all of the wrath of my Father on myself so that when he was hanging on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'd never uttered those words before. He'd never been far away from the Father. He'd never had the Father look at him with disgust because he'd taken all these sins. That's never happened before, but he did that. Why? For us, because he loved us so much. And this is where we are now. He says, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his sons, while we were still his what? His enemies. Is that another thing you used to say? Hi, my name's Will. I was dead. I was God's enemy. I belonged to Satan. And I did foolish things. That, that's not normally how we start off, right? Sometimes, you know, when you're in an AA meeting, you say, yeah, Hey, my name's Will, and I'm an alcoholic, right? Because that's my history. Hey, my name's Will. I was dead, lost to the world under God's wrath and God's enemy. That's, that's who I used, that's my claim to fame. Because that's all I had, right? 
we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Not because of anything I have done in the past or the future could dream up, could attempt to do, has anything to do with God accepting me now. Why? I'm saved by who? By the life of his son. Right? Because on the third day, Christ arose and claimed victory over all that sin and death and judgment. He says, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. Not because of the good things that we have done, but because why? Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Mm. So when we come to communion... We're not sitting here worried about, am I good enough to have communion today? No, you're never good enough on your own. If that's the question, I'll give you. If, you're, if it's going through your brain, am I good enough to have communion today? My answer is no. Is Christ good enough to restore your relationship with God and let you celebrate that restoration? Absolutely. Absolutely. Has anything that you have done this week broken that, stopped his power in your life to steal that from you? No. It's not in your power because you weren't the one that provided it in the first place, right? This gift of God wasn't your creation. And it's not yours to take the power of it away. That's why Paul says, for I am certain that nothing in all of creation, no powers, no principalities, nothing in the past and the future, no fears or doubts, nothing can separate us from the love of God in what? In Christ Jesus, right? Yeah. Let's keep going back. I want to go back to Ephesians again. He says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, right? And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. There's nothing you did, nothing you did in the past, nothing you're going to do today, and nothing in the future that will ever earn the right for you to be restored with God. Because you can't, right? But God says, it's my gift to you. And it cost me beyond measure to give you that gift, right? It's the salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast, right? So I don't, I don't care if you're seven years old and you're just starting to learn about who God is, or you're like some of us in our congregation, not me yet, but some that are in their 80s, maybe even the 90s. None of us can boast about that, right? We only get to boast about, so it's not, it's not our good works. Whose good works was it? Christ's. Christ's good work. And when he sees us, <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't look at us and go, ah, man, I don't, I don't know. Matt, you're, you're kind of okay. You're sort of in the family, but if you could just get your act together, right, you'd be a little bit more in the family. No, what is, when God sees Matt now, what does he say? He says, Matt, you are God's, what is it? Masterpiece. What's a masterpiece? That's like the thing that you created that is the epitome of all of your ability and everybody stands in awe of, right? And God says, when he sees Matt, he says, Matt, your most amazing creation. I've created the, the universe, right? The stars and the galaxy and all the things in the world. He says, but no, but my, that's, God doesn't say that's his masterpiece. He says, Matt, is his masterpiece. Isn't that amazing? Casey, did you know that you, 
Like, you, never, you, never, you never thought about that when you looked at Matt before, did you? I do, though. <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's who he is. And Casey, you are God's masterpiece. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He said, he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Did you get that? The good things didn't get me to God. Whose good things got me to God? God's good things, the gift of his son, that got me to God. But now that I'm with God, he says, for the first time in your life, you are free to go and do good things with me, which you could never do in the past because you had no power to do them at all. Let's get that next slide. Look at this last line. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Now we twist that a lot of times. We say, because when we fail, which we do every day, right? Even though we may have accepted that gift of God, I still have this old body and brain that has the old thoughts. I'm not, when I get to heaven at some point, God says, I'm going to give you a new body. I'm going to be in your presence and you're not going to do foolish things anymore. But I, even, even though I am here and I'm part of God's creation, I still, I still do foolish things, right? And you do foolish things. And when we do those, we start doubting, well, maybe I've done enough foolish things that God isn't going to see me as his masterpiece anymore, right? Maybe I've thrown enough mud on that masterpiece that it doesn't look that good. God says, no. You, you didn't create the masterpiece. I'd created the masterpiece. You can't tear down the masterpiece. It's my masterpiece. You have no power to destroy that masterpiece because it's mine. You are completely powerless to remove yourself from God's family once he's brought you in because that was his gift, his power that did that, right? But God says now you have the freedom to go do good things like him. And, and you know what? It's not like it's some discovery channel to go figure out, well, I wonder what those things could possibly be, right? Because I don't know, God doesn't know, but let's go figure that out. When, when did God have those good things planned for you? When does he say? Long ago, from eternity past, he knew that he was going to draw you into his family. And he knew what the good things were that you could do now that you didn't know him before, Right? And he knew you had no power when you were still far away and as, as his enemy to do any of those good things. But he says, now you have the power to do them. Give me that next slide. So our relationship with God is not restored by our good works. There's nothing Don could do when he was dead in Satan's kingdom, God's enemy, to restore that, right? Could do it. Because when you're far away from God, you can't do any good works. You don't know what love is. You don't know what peace is. You don't know what generosity is. Because you're running away from it. How could you give that to anybody? You may have little odd reflections of it that people look at you on the side and say, oh, that was a good thing. It wasn't from a heart that really knew how to love, right? But once God gives you that gift of restoration through his son who died on that cross and took all your penalties, the first thing is he restores that relationship. That's one thing we're going to celebrate today, right? And we, we need to stop and be in awe of that today and not take that for granted. 
But there's something else to celebrate too. It wasn't just I moved from being God's enemy to being his friend. I moved from being in Satan's kingdom to be in God's kingdom. I moved from being broken and ugly to being a masterpiece, right? God says, I now can do good works just like him. I can be part of what God is doing to help restore other people to him as well too, right? Does God need me? Does he need Daywin? Does he need Kim? Does he, does he need, need us to do his good works? Doesn't have to have us, right? But guess what? Since we're part of his family, he wants us. He wants us to come alongside and be with him and do it. Yeah. Kim and I, we watch our grandkids every day. Got four of them from 10 down to four. And there's sometimes when you're trying to do some of the household chores, right? You know, you'd like to encourage them to be part of it, right? Do you know what my, my granddaughter, Laurel, I want her, her, the thing she always asks to do, you know what it is? She says, Grandpa, I want to clean toilets. <laughs> okay, I got to encourage this. <laughs> now, her method of toilets may not be the same as what yours is to clean them, but she would like to play in it at least and do something there, right? Okay. And there's sometimes where we just get frustrated with this, man, it's just so much easier to just do this by myself. Because if I do it by myself, I can do what? I get it done, right? Sometimes having them along is much more painful, right? It's like, okay, let's sort the laundry. Oh, Grandpa, I don't want to do that. Uh, well, look, look through that. Just get your stuff out of the pile. Oh, no. It's just a, that's when they all lay on the floor and they start writhing, you know. You have to do something like that. <laughs> so you just, you just want to get the fire hose and sweep them out of the room and say, just give me some peace. I'll get the work done. Well, you know what? We're, we're like that with God sometimes too, right? Okay, he's got his good works planned for us to do. And we're just like, ah, I just want to be selfish and do my own thing, right? And thank God he's got a lot more patience than I do because he says, no, I actually want you to be part of this, okay? So he waits for us because he takes joy. He takes joy in the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and he takes joy in a relationship with us. And as he, as the triune God, has been doing amazing things for all of eternity, he wants us to be part of that as well. So something else to celebrate today is that God's free gift of salvation in Christ frees us to finally go and do some good works. Not because it's a debt we have to pay back. Not because if we don't do it, we're going to lose God's friendship, right? Not because he's going to be angry with us, because he takes great joy in that with us. Yeah. So I just want to hit that next slide. This is what Jesus said. He said, you are the light of the world. Who's the light of the world? Marty in the back is the light of the world, right? Mike back there is the light of the world. Rebecca, the light of the world, right? Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, remember these good deeds that you're freed to do because God said you're free now, that you're part of my family for the first time you actually, he says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that what? so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. So when we leave here today, whether you're six-year-old or 86-year-old, you have an opportunity to go shine with your life so that other people can see the good things that you're doing and praise who? Praise you? No, what? Praise God. Right? Right. And that's a thing we ought to be in awe about with God as well. That he would even let us be a part of anything he has going on. But he chooses to. Next slide. So let's just reflect a little bit. 
Have you thought about yourself as God's partner? In every minute of your day? And the good things he's got going on? If you haven't taken this gift of his son, I will tell you one thing. You may be saying no, and the reason is because if you haven't taken that gift, you're not his partner. You're still his what? You're still his enemy. Okay? And don't think that you're his partner because of the good things you've done. You couldn't, there's nothing good you did that made you his partner. It was because of his son. So if that's where you are, then, then just be honest with yourself. No, I'm not his partner. Maybe I need to take care of that, right? <clears throat> How hard is that to take care of? It's between you and God. You don't have to... I'm, I'm not in the middle of that. That's just you going to God and saying, God, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm far away from you. I'm a fool. I can't make it on my own. I'm under your condemnation. And I need to be saved. I need to be restored with you. And the only way to do that is through your son. So agree with them and say, God, I accept that gift. <laughs> and just be gracious and say, what an amazing gift. Thank you. I accept that. That's a conversation between you and God. You know what? You could have that this morning. And then, then you are a partner, right? Maybe you've <clears throat> had that conversation with God, but you, don't, you haven't been thinking about yourself as a partner with him every day. If that's... then you've lost something that he's given you. That's yours. Don't walk away from it. How do you understand the calling you share with other Christians? And God says, that partnership, I didn't just give that to you by yourself. He says, I, I did that in the context of the body of Christ. Right? What does he say? Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Right? Spur one another on to love and good deeds. All these one another things happen, can only happen in community with each other. He says, how might you walk worthy of your calling today at home and in your community? Not worthy so that you can <clears throat> be a friend of God. You're already a friend of God, right? So here's something to think about. You, you will never be loved, if you accepted that gift, you will never be loved by God more than you are this instant. And you'll never be loved any less than you are in this instant. Because God has given you his perfect love. There wasn't any degrees of that based upon how good or bad you are, right? It's his love. So maybe, maybe part of communion for you today is to stop and be in awe of God's good works to draw you into his family. Maybe part of communion today is <clears throat> I'm not there. And I can't, communion is a celebration of that. And if you're not there, you don't take communion because there's nothing to celebrate yet. That's okay, just be honest. You don't have to do that for us. God, it's between you and God, right? Maybe you need to have that conversation. But maybe, maybe part of communion today is to say, God, I have not been in awe of being a partner with you. And I need to. And thank you. Just maybe part of communion today is telling God, thank you for letting me do that, right? And maybe communion today is starting this afternoon is just getting your eyes open and say, what does that look like to be that partner in my family? With the person at Speedway, maybe you're going out to lunch someplace. Maybe you're going shopping today. Maybe it's that person that ripped you off this week on your car repair. That happened to somebody in our church this week, right? All kind of opportunities, right? to be a partner in God's good works. Yeah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you hmm. for seeking us out. When as it says in Romans 1, we, were, we weren't just sinful, we were running into it and running away from you as hard as we could. We were as evil as we knew how we were as evil as we could get away with and only constrained by things you put in this world. In the midst of all of that, you came and died for us. And you didn't die for us because we were lovely. lovely. You, you died for us because 
You, you just wanted to have that friendship with us and relationship with us in spite of how ugly we were. And God, we're in awe that you took all of that brokenness and ugliness and you say, it's a masterpiece. And it was a masterpiece the instant we came to you, our lives, and it's a masterpiece today and it'll be a masterpiece for all eternity, not because of what we do, but because you created us to be a masterpiece. God, help us to be in awe of that and of being able of that friendship and love and fellowship and family that happened with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit through all eternity, that, that we get to be included in that embrace in a way that the angels don't even understand because they were never called your family. They were servants that served in your house, but we get to be family. What an amazing thing. And God, help us to be in awe that, that as you're out doing your good works every day and calling others to your home to be part of your family as well, God, we get to be part of that too. God, help us not to lose the awe of that as well. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.